One idle morning last month, Dave was sitting behind the counter in his record store, fiddling unconsciously with his wedding ring when he realized, first with mild interest and then with growing alarm, that he couldn't get the ring off his finger. <laughs> Not that he wanted to. Until that is, he noticed he couldn't remove it and then he wanted to very, very much. He tugged and he twisted the ring until his finger turned red and puffy and then he put his finger in his mouth and he tried to pull the ring off with his teeth. And that was the moment, the moment when Dave was sitting alone in his store with his finger in his mouth, that he entered the world of irrational fear. In the blink of an eye, his store felt airless, as if all the oxygen had been used up, as if there was no air left to breathe. And in the blink of an eye, Dave was overcome with the need to move, as if the only way to get air into his lungs was by moving. And still... The ring wouldn't budge. He locked up and he flipped a sign into the record store window that read, Be Right Back. And he hurried down the street, twisting the ring as he went. Well, he didn't have a clue where he was heading. He was too overwhelmed by a sense of the world collapsing in upon him, too overwhelmed by the need to get going to pay any attention to where he was going to. He called Morley from a payphone about 15 minutes later. I can't get my wedding ring off, he said. <laughs> N not that I want to, added Dave into the silence. O or need to or anything, said Dave. The, the knowledge that he was talking to his wife was calming him down. It's uncomfortable, he said later that night as they sat in the kitchen after supper. It's like an itch you can't reach. Morley took his hand in hers, and Dave felt the panic returning, looming like a swamp monster over some swamp horizon that he thought was far away, but turned out to be right there in his kitchen. <laughs> Most of all, he needed to get the ring off his finger or he was going to go crazy. You're not the shape you used to be, Morley was saying. There's, <laughs> there's been movement. This happens. You could have it sized, said Morley. They can make it bigger. He went to a jeweler before he went to work the next morning. It's a nice ring, said the jeweler. We had it made, said Dave. It's one of a kind. The jeweler said, you can have it back in a week. That night, Dave showed Morley the indentation on his finger where the ring had been. It was like a, a phantom ring. Feels good to have it off, he told Morley. They had been married 23 years. Morley's eyes narrowed, but only imperceptibly. <laughs> I've had that ring on my hand almost as long as I haven't, Dave said. It, it felt like it was squeezing me. <laughs> oh, said Morley. <laughs> oh, was all she said. Then things shifted again. It started to bother Dave that it bothered him. He said, I'm, I'm so set in my ways that all it takes is a stupid ring to throw me off kilter. I'm fat and I'm almost 50 and every morning I have orange juice and cereal for breakfast at more or less the same time and more or less the same place and I, I take the same three sandwiches to lunch every day and, and look, he said, pulling his sweater up over his stomach, every time I wear this shirt, I wear this sweater. <laughs> Mor Morley didn't say anything. But what she thought was, stupid ring? It's a stupid ring? <laughs> By the week's end, Dave wasn't talking about the ring anymore. He knew enough to keep quiet about it. By the week's end, he had noticed that every time he brought up the ring, Morley would get cranky. He got the ring back a week before he left for Nova Scotia. His sister Annie had called and said Elizabeth had a stroke. His father's sister, Elizabeth. And he said, I have to go to Boston for a week. I, I think you should come. He went the following Monday. Morley drove him to the airport. As Dave reached into the back seat for the bag, Morley noticed the ring on his finger and she smiled. I love you, she said. Look after Elizabeth. He checked into the Lord Nelson Hotel and he went right away to the hospital. Elizabeth was confused. At first she recognized him, then she had no idea who he was. 
The doctor said, it's early, don't worry, she's going to be okay. The next morning, coming down in the elevator, he realized he had locked his key in his room. He would get one at the front desk later, it was early. He went for a walk and bought a book at one of the bookstores near his hotel, and then he wandered into the public gardens. He sat on a bench for a while near the bandstand, and then he bought a bag of peanuts in a plastic bag, and in a preoccupied, not paying attention sort of way, he began to feed them to a duck who was hanging around his bench. Before long, Dave had a fluster of ducks squabbling for peanuts. It made him happy just to be sitting there feeding ducks. He was trying to be fair about it. <laughs> he was trying to spread the nuts around so all the ducks had a chance, not only the aggressive ones. And there was one tentative duck on the edge of the circle, constantly being cut out. Dave reached down into his bag of nuts and threw some to the duck on the edge. And the other ducks turned and charged furiously towards it. And in the middle of the commotion, Dave caught a brief flash of metal in the sunlight amongst his peanuts on the ground. And he thought, some poor sod has lost a ring. And then he felt for his own ring. And to his horror, he felt only finger. And he realized he was the poor sod. That was his ring glinting in the sun. And he looked again and he realized to his horror that his ring had just been gobbled up by the hungry left out duck. <laughs> Dave stared at the duck in dumb disbelief. The duck was staring back at him. Dave dropped his bag of nuts and he lunged at the duck. The duck squawked in outrage and fluttered about five feet in the air. It landed in the middle of a new group of ducks on the other side of the path. Dave knew that if he looked away for even an instant, he wouldn't be able to tell his duck from the other ducks. The duck stood up on its legs and began to flap its wings. It looked like it was going to take off. In desperation, Dave pulled off his jacket and flung it in the air. For an instant, the jacket hung in the air like a shadow and then it enveloped the bird and there was a moment of confusion and feathers and squawks, and then Dave was standing in the park with a duck wrapped in his jacket. <laughs> a duck tucked under his arm like a loaf of bread. He looked around to see if anyone had noticed. <laughs> there was a woman holding the hand of a small boy. <laughs> she was staring at him in horror. What are you going to do with that duck, she said. <laughs> Dave had no idea what he was going to do with a duck. Roasted, he said as he strode past her. <laughs> he knew he had to get out of the park as quickly as he could. The duck was surprisingly quiet as they crossed South Park Road. Surprisingly well-behaved. The duck seemed relatively happy under the coat. Dave made it all the way to the hotel and across the hotel lobby and almost to the elevators before he remembered he didn't have his room key. He lined up at the front desk. remembering that this wasn't the first time he had stood in front of a hotel clerk with a bird under his arm. <laughs> the clerk looked down to check his name on the hotel computer, and Dave tried to rearrange the duck, and the duck quacked. The clerk looked up abruptly, Dave said, I beg your pardon, excuse me. <laughs> he squeezed the duck against it. <laughs> he squeezed the duck against his body as he walked across the lobby. Apparently, he squeezed too hard. 
Now, people sometimes use the expression as loose as a goose. <laughs> Not, however, people who know about these things. People who know about these things know that a goose dingleberry comes out pretty well packed. A duck dump, on the other hand, comes out, well, as loose as a goose. <laughs> Once the elevator doors had closed behind them and Dave and his duck had a moment of privacy, Dave opened his jacket to see what was going on, which is something he wouldn't do if he was able to do it over again. As soon as the duck saw the elevator lights, it began to beat its wings furiously. In an instant, the quiet duck became a wiggling mass of kicking and quacking feathers. It became a, a scratching and biting duck. When the elevator doors opened on the fourth floor, Dave was barely holding onto the duck by its little duck feet while it beat him mercilessly with its wings. The elderly couple waiting for the elevator... Didn't say a word. <laughs> not to Dave, not to each other. They didn't step forward into the elevator, nor did they step back. They just stood motionless and speechless. They stood staring as the feathers flew and the elevator doors first opened and then closed. <laughs> Two floors later, when the elevator doors opened again, the duck gave Dave a mighty whack with a wing and Dave lost his grip for an instant, and suddenly the duck was loose. Suddenly it was flying down the corridor with Dave in pursuit. He rounded the corner at the end of the hall, and he had already taken three steps before he stopped, and he gasped, and he spun in the air and headed back the way he had come. The tables had been turned. The duck was coming towards him with fire in its eyes. Dave lurched back down the corridor, bouncing off a fire extinguisher, glancing over his shoulder, looking for an open door, thinking as he heard the beat of the wings that this was closer than he ever wanted to get to the running of the bulls in Pamplona, Spain. <laughs> it took 12 minutes of utter madness before he got the duck under his arm and into his room, and then the duck bit him and the chase was on again. <laughs> around and around the bedroom, Dave after the duck, the duck after Dave... The two of them with enough adrenaline coursing through their bodies to fuel a British soccer riot. <laughs> when Dave had finally corralled the duck into the bathroom and the bathroom door was shut behind it, there were feathers and duck muck everywhere. It took Dave almost an hour to clean up. He checked each duck defilement for his ring. And then he collapsed into the wing-back chair in the corner of his bedroom and he stared at his empty finger. He looked at the closed bathroom door. It was eerily quiet in there. He got up and he cracked the door to see what was going on. The, the duck had pushed one of the hotel towels up against the edge of the tub and had fashioned a sort of nest. It seemed content as Dave slipped into the bathroom. It's nice in here, isn't it, said Dave. Yeah, <laughs> said the duck. <laughs> Dave checked each doo-doo in the bathroom but there was no ring there either. He filled up the tub with water and he lay on the bed wondering what he should do next. The duck seemed to have settled comfortably ever since it had made its nest. Dave cracked the bathroom door and he shrugged as the duck waddled into the bedroom. It began pecking at the carpet. Dave got some corn chips from the mini bar and left them in a pile near the television. He could feel a wave of panic building again. Morley would be furious if she knew where the ring was, he thought. He got up and he looked at the duck. This isn't about us, he said. It's about my wife. <laughs> if I feel like this, he said, imagine what my wife would feel like. I'm doing this for her. He put the duck back in the bathroom and a do not disturb sign on his door. And he went to the hospital. And when he came back at dinner time, there was duck slop everywhere but still no ring. He opened the bathroom door and he phoned room service and ordered himself a beer and a half a dozen oysters on a shell. When the duck saw the oysters, she ran across the room and sat at his feet. So he ordered her a dozen and they watched the early news together. <laughs> Ha ha ha!
After the news, he went through the latest mound of duck dirt. Her production was beyond belief. At this rate, he figured the time from bill to butt couldn't be more than 24 hours. He ordered another dozen oysters and they watched The Simpsons. Dave had seen the episode, but the duck seemed to like it. After supper, he went to the library and he learned that everything a duck ingests goes into its crop before it goes into its stomach. And he read that the crop is a muscular processing plant full of little stones which grind the food before it's digested. According to the book he read, Dave's ring would be ground to gold dust before he'd ever see it. <laughs> or more likely, it would just stay in the duck's crop until the duck died. He went back to the hotel room and he wrapped the duck back up in his fouled jacket and he took her across the street to the public gardens and he let her go. And when he put her down on the path, she flapped her wings a few times and then waddled away without a backward glance. Good luck, said Dave. She didn't seem to want it. As he watched her slip into the brush, Dave wondered where his ring would end up and who would find it and how long from now and what they would think, what story they would make up when they found the ring. He didn't sleep well, wondering what he would tell Morley about the ring, worrying about what she would say. Early in the morning, he took his jacket to the front desk and asked the concierge if he could have it cleaned. <laughs> the concierge stared at the foul jacket and his lip began to curl. It's clam chowder, said Dave. <laughs> of course, said the concierge, <laughs> flicking a feather off the counter with disdain. <laughs> he visited Elizabeth. She was getting clearer each day. The doctor told him she would go to rehab for at least a few months. Dave told Elizabeth he had to go home. I'll be back in a month, he told her. At lunch, he went to a jewelry shop not far from the hotel and with a heavy heart bought an extravagant silver bracelet for Morley. He had, he'd never bought her jewelry in his life. The store, the clerk, and the enormous quantity of jewelry overwhelmed him. He almost fled without buying anything. But the clerk was fussing with him with such attentiveness that Dave didn't want to disappoint him. He finally chose a silver bracelet. It cost a small fortune. But if he was going to go home empty-handed, he couldn't go empty-handed. He thought it was a pretty bracelet, but he wasn't sure. Morley would have to tell him. <laughs> he went back to the hospital to see Elizabeth one last time. But she was asleep, and he didn't wake her. He went to the hotel to pick up his jacket. He had two hours before his plane took off. When he got there, he couldn't find his ticket stub, and he looked at the concierge hopelessly. It's all right, said the concierge with a smirk. I remember you. Clam chowder. <laughs> he handed Dave the jacket on a hanger and a small envelope. The cleaners found a ring in your pocket, he said. I imagine you'd want to wear it home. <laughs> Dave had time to take the hotel bus to the airport. As they pulled by the public gardens, he put the ring back on his finger and stared at it. 23 years was a long time. He didn't have any regrets. He had a window seat on the plane and he was served a surprisingly good meal. He had two glasses of wine with his supper and a drink later. He flew the final hour with his face pressed to the window, watching the sun setting ahead of them and holding his bracelet in his hands, thinking nothing happens without a reason. He was holding the bracelet as the wheels bit into the runway. It made him anxious to hold it, but it was a new kind of anxiety. It felt fresh and exciting. He had never done anything like this before. It made him happy just to hold it. Thank you.